There will also be an update regarding another case at the end of this video. This case takes place in the United Kingdom and begins in 1993. Peter Bryan was a 23-year-old man who lived in East London. He worked at a clothing store as a shop assistant in Chelsea. During his time working at the store, he became infatuated with the owner's daughter, a 20-year-old woman named Nisha Seth. Nisha was the one who ran the store and would often work with Peter. But on one of his shifts, Peter had been caught stealing clothing. The owner of the store swiftly fired Peter. There was also some other concerning behaviour. Whilst working, Peter would sometimes talk to himself in what sounded like a different language. And in the months before being fired, he had on occasion showed signs of unprovoked aggression. Nisha had also told her family that on one occasion, he had even grabbed her inappropriately. On the 18th of March 1993, Peter returned to the store he once worked, wielding a claw hammer. He had come for revenge for being fired. Inside the store on this day was Nisha and her 12-year-old brother. He entered the store and hit the boy's head with the hammer, resulting in him falling to the ground. Peter then made his way towards Nisha, who was on the phone with her friend. Peter grabbed her and pulled her from the phone and began a vicious attack. He struck her in the head multiple times with a claw hammer, caving in her skull. Peter had hit Nisha with such force that her brain tissue was exposed. Nisha's brother got up to see his sister on the ground with deep cavities in her head. He ran from the store as quickly as he could to get some help, but Peter saw him and began to chase him still wielding the hammer. Peter chased him for some time but was unable to catch up to him, and when passers-by saw Peter chasing the boy with a the hammer, they intervened and Peter ran away from the scene. The ambulance was called and tragically, Nisha was pronounced dead at this scene. Nisha's younger brother was okay, but required a number of stitches from the blow to the head from the hammer. The police were now on the lookout for Peter. Less than an hour after the murder had been committed, he was seen hanging by his fingertips from a third floor apartment balcony. He then fell feet first to the ground, breaking his legs and ankles. His plan was to jump head first to end his life, but he had a change of mind. Peter was hospitalised until the 30th of April 1993 and then was transferred to Brixton Prison with a charge of murder. On the 22nd of November 1993, Peter wrote the following letter to Nisha's father from Brixton Prison. Dear Sir, I am writing to say how very, very, very sorry I am. I would have liked to be a part of your family, but due to this situation, this does not look possible. Telling Nisha that I loved her over and over again just does not work. If there is a problem with the colour of me, you are selling yourself too cheap. So, if you would be so kind to send my clothes to HM Prison, Jeb Avenue, Brixton, London. Peter never admitted to the charge of murder, instead opting for manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility. At the time, he was diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic and thus, was sentenced indefinitely to a maximum security psychiatric unit. For seven and a half years, this is where Peter resided. During his time there, Peter's background was evaluated by professionals. Peter recalled bullying other children from an early age, particularly those he perceived as being physically weaker than himself. He said that he enjoyed having power over those weaker than him, and would force them to give him sweets and money and make them do things such as tying his shoelaces. He also admitted that from the age of 12 he had carried weapons and committed street robberies as part of a gang. And in 1987 when Peter was just 18, he had tried to throw someone out of a six-story building. By February 2001, the nursing staff working at the high-end security unit firmly believed that Peter had made considerable progress, especially in his maturity and anger. They now claimed that he was a much better man, and that he was rehabilitated enough to rejoin society under supervision. Peter was released into the care of a social worker who had never worked with a convicted killer. In 2002, he was moved to the Riverside Hostel in North London, where he was allowed door keys and could come and go as he pleased. And by 2003, plans were made for Peter to move to a more independent accommodation. And in February of 2004, an application for Peter to live in low support accommodation was submitted and granted. 
But then Peter was transferred to an open psychiatric ward at Newham General Hospital for his safety. After allegations that he had committed SA upon a 16-year-old girl that lived close to the hostel, Despite this very serious allegation, this was never reported to the Home Office. It was still agreed that Peter could leave the ward as much as he wanted, believing that he was no longer a threat. Peter had become friends with a man named Brian Cherry, and the two had been friends for around two years. Brian lived close to the hostel that Peter was staying at. He was described as a good man who had few friends. Brian did have a woman in his life named Nicola, that he believed to be his girlfriend, but in reality, she was taking advantage of his loneliness and was able to extract money from him. On the 17th of February 2004, Peter was allowed to leave the accommodation and he made his way over to Brian's home. On the way, he stopped off at a shop to grab a couple of items. He purchased a Stanley knife, a screwdriver and a claw hammer. At around 6pm, Peter knocked on Brian's door and Brian let him in. At around 7.30pm, Nicola arrived at Brian's door. She knocked and nobody answered, but she could see that somebody was inside. The lock on Brian's door didn't work properly. She knew this and so she was able to open the door. Upon entering, she was immediately met with the strong smell of disinfectant. As she stepped further into the house, Peter came out of the front room. He was sweating profusely and was also topless. Peter told Nicola to leave immediately. She asked Peter where Brian was and Peter replied, Brian Cherry is dead. Nicola was able to get a glimpse behind Peter and into Brian's front room. She saw Brian on the floor laying on his back naked and his right arm had been dismembered and was lying a few inches away from his body. She pretended not to see this horrendous sight. She smiled and said, Okay, I'll see you later, closed the door behind her, and left. Nicola went straight to her mother's house and asked her mother to call the police. She didn't want to do it herself as she believed there to be a warrant out for her arrest. So Nicola's mother told the police to go over to Brian's flat as soon as possible and explained the situation her daughter had encountered. The police swiftly arrived at the scene and knocked on the door but they got no response. After a couple of attempts, they decided to break down the door to get inside. The lights were off and there was total darkness with an intense smell of disinfectant in the air. As the officers crept forward, Peter emerged. He was covered in blood, only wearing his jeans. Peter stood motionless, just staring at the officers. The officers asked Peter what was going on and he replied by telling them he had broken into the flat and there had been an altercation. The police walked further into the house and they saw the dead body of Brian laying on the ground. They asked Peter if he had done this, to which he simply replied, I did it, yeah, but I don't know why I did it. The police then further inspected the flat. They went into the room where the body was and saw that both of Brian's arms and his right leg had been completely severed from his body. His head had been caved in and partially cut off. Surrounding Brian's body were the items that Peter had previously bought. The Stanley knife, the screwdriver and the hammer. All of them were covered with blood. In the kitchen, the police officer found human hair and flesh from an arm. It had been sliced off and was sitting on a plate ready to be eaten. And on the cooker was a frying pan containing a white fleshy substance, which appeared to have been cooked. As the officer was in the kitchen, Peter turned and smiled to the other officer and said, I ate his brain with butter. It was very nice. Peter had used the claw hammer to break into Brian's skull and pulled some of his brain matter out to fry and consume. Forensic evidence would later confirm this. His head had been struck with the hammer over 20 times and had been partially cut off. Peter had also sliced flesh from Brian's arms and legs and consumed that too. Peter was asked why he had dismembered Brian Cherry's limbs. He replied, I wanted to carry him out bit by bit and get rid of the body. I used a Stanley knife to cut them off and some other kitchen knives, but I had to stamp on them to break the bone. As the officers were waiting for a van to arrive to escort Peter to the station, he told them, I wanted his soul. Peter was charged with the murder of Brian. 
While in prison, Peter's mental state began to rapidly diminish. By March 2004, it was clear that he was becoming more violent. He had told those who worked at the prison that he wanted to kill a warder and eat his nose. The prison officers had to use riot shields when unlocking his cell in case of an attack. On the 15th of April 2004, he was transferred to Broadmoor Hospital, a maximum security facility. A mistake in the management of the hospital placed Peter into medium security. Just 10 days after his arrival at Broadmoor Hospital, Peter violently attacked a fellow patient named Richard Loudwell. Richard was a 60-year-old man who was awaiting trial for the murder of an 82-year-old woman and was a patient on the same ward as Peter. On the 25th of April 2004, three members of staff heard two bangs coming from the dining room. They went to see what the noise was and found Richard lying on the floor next to a table and chair. Peter said that he had strangled Richard with a piece of cord and smashed his head into the floor. Richard was rushed to hospital, but died from complications from the trauma to his brain. Following this attack, Peter was moved into maximum security and was kept under constant supervision like he should have been from the start. He was also evaluated further by the doctors. In an interview, Peter said, I get these urges. I've had these urges ever since I saw Richard. He's from the bottom of the food chain, old and haggard. I was just waiting for my chance to get at him. I wanted to kill and eat him. I didn't have much time. If I did, I would have cooked and eaten him. The doctors then asked him if he thought cannibalism was normal, to which he replied, Of course it's normal. Cannibalism is normal. It's been here for centuries. If I was on the streets, I'd go for someone bigger, you know, for a challenge. I felt excited when I attacked him. I wanted to sleep with him when he was alive, and I also wanted to do it when he was dead. I wanted to cook him, but there was no time nor the access to cooking equipment. I briefly considered eating him raw. Peter then named another patient as his next target and said, It's something like a ritual. I must be becoming a serial something. He then told the doctor, You look like a brainy chap and you're quite slim. I think I could take you and went on to describe how Brian's arms and legs tasted like chicken. The doctor who spoke with Peter would claim that he was the most dangerous man he had ever spoken to. He said that on a whim, Peter was capable of acting normal if he needed to. Peter was charged with the murder of Brian and Richard, and in October of 2004, an application was granted to join the two charges together, and was tried for the murders during the same trial. Peter was found guilty and given a life sentence. The judge was then required to set the minimum sentence to be 35 years. Although Peter appealed against the minimum of 35 years and it was reduced to 15 years because of the fact that the killings were committed when Peter was suffering from severe mental illness. But the court indicated that it was unlikely that Peter would ever be released. Questions were brought up about those who oversaw Peter's case and the obvious failures that had occurred. An inquiry was conducted, but no disciplinary action was taken. Peter is still a patient at Broadmoor to this day, and hopefully, that's exactly where he will stay. And now for an update on a previous case that may warm your heart a little. I recently covered the story of Diane Pransky. If you've seen the video, you'll know it's an incredibly horrific story. Upon finishing the script for the video, I discovered an active fundraiser for Diane as due to her injuries, she is in need of constant care and was also in need of a new wheelchair. Well, I left a link for the fundraiser and I honestly didn't expect the response. Together, the disturbing community was able to raise thousands for Diane. Before the video went live, Diane's fund was at just over $6,000 and because of your generous support, the fund now sits at just over 14000 I've briefly spoken with Diane's daughter and she's incredibly grateful for all of your donations, so thank you all very much.